this has to do with my vision for why I do the course, but also for what I believe about the church and what I would like to see the church doing in the world, what, what we're about. And so thinking for a moment of Jesus coming, <clears throat> what a wild idea that the invisible, infinite, omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscient God would, in theological terms, kind of condescend, come down, limit himself. We even say himself. It's bigger than even that kind of a terminology, God, to an infant, or you could say to an embryo, to be birthed, to be completely uh, reliant on humans, helpless, and growing through life. Along the way, uh, he's growing in wisdom and stature before God and man, it describes in Luke 4. Somewhere along the line, he's the word of God's becoming pretty deeply understood in his being. We even see when he's 12 years old that he's reasoning, he stays behind his from one of the feasts and is talking with rabbis and understanding in ways that they're saying, this is crazy. He's teaching us. He's interacting on very deep levels. And when his parents find him after a couple of days, they're like, what in the world are you doing? He said, don't you know I would be about my father's business? I had to be about my father's business. That he's growing in an understanding. He's using the term at that point, my father. That hadn't been the way people re responded to God. So he's understanding identity at that point. We see him now at some point he's clarifying this idea that that the scriptures prophesying a Messiah, Emmanuel, that he is those things. Can't even imagine what that's like. Comes to a point where John the Baptist is preaching and there's a kind of revival happening in Israel where people are responding to the way that John is speaking, you know, he's probably quoting Old Testament scriptures and teaching on holiness and the conviction of sin is heavy, which you may have experienced that and in, in your own life or when it's in a corporate setting, it's really powerful. It's almost like uh, when Dan described the presence of God in their prayer meeting, if you've ever been in a setting, could be for a length of time, could be days or so that's months or, where just the presence of God deep in an area. And in this manifestation, there's this incredible conviction of sin. They're coming out into the wilderness. He's speaking. He's baptizing people in uh, a lot of histories. It would seem that John the Baptist had a much larger following than Jesus even had. And so people are coming out and convicted of sin being baptized in the midst of that is when Jesus kind of goes public and he comes out and is baptized, identifying with the need of repentance for the people of Israel, which is interesting because he is the one who provides forgiveness for the confession or repentance that they're doing. So he's identifying with us so that we can now identify with him and his death. Um. <clears throat> And after that, and we see particularly it's clearly in, in Luke that as soon as he's baptized, then the Holy Spirit leads him out and he's um, in the desert alone, 40 days and 40 nights and fasting. And he's, the devil is really tempting him with the same kinds, but deeper than we're tempted with if his identity and uh, provision and fame or or what he would want to be or how he would want to be seen. And he's continually responding with the truth of God's word. He comes back out of that space and he that's where he de describes in, again, Luke 4, um, that the spirit of the Lord, he's quoting from Isaiah, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to 
care for the oppressed and to set people free and to bring healing and sight to the blind and says, this is being fulfilled right here and now in your hearing. They like it for the first part and they don't like it at the end when he's really calling people to be responsive. And he starts to gather his followers, which he calls apostles. We hear the word, we see the word disciple, which is student, and, and there's other rabbis who would gather 10 students, but he's calling them apostles. That's a little different. I don't know that rabbis had apostles, they had students or disciples, but apostles mean sent ones. And what we see there is that when Jesus chooses the 12, I believe he is symbolically expressing his intention to rebuild Israel, that he's reconstituting the government. He's coming to change the way things are done. He's coming to bring heaven to earth. That's why Jesus came. We want to kind of go up to heaven. A lot of people are praying about going to heaven. That's not how Jesus prayed. He's praying to bring heaven to earth, right? You pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed, holy be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven, bringing it down. He wants to bring the government of heaven down. And around him, he's setting up apostles as his center, uh, central leaders. And the word means sent one. An apostle represents the ones that send him. And so shares in that person's authority. And we see in Matthew 10 and Luke 9, he's gathering the 12 to do that. He's giving them authority to heal the sick and to cast out demons. And remember in Matthew 16, he says, I'm going to build my church and the gates of Hades or the gates of hell will not overcome it. I submit to you guys that when he says, I'm going to build my church, he's not talking about anything like what we see in church. Nothing like it. He's not talking about worship services. We never see him doing that. He's not talking about buildings. We never see him trying to gather that. He's not talking about really anything that we think of as church. I'm submitting, although he's this is the first time the word church, ecclesia, is used in the Bible. It's not the first time it was used in that Greek word. The Ecclesia of ancient Athens this is about six for six four six hundred years, not just six hundred years before. For so, six hundred years before and up through when Jesus was on earth, the word Ecclesia was used in Athens, and it was a a, a word or a gathering, a popular assembly that was male citizens. They had to be. Uh, I think they had to be over the age of 18. It was an assembly of males, a, a leader, a leadership of less than 20%. It could be between, uh, so there was like 30,000 in the area, in the city, and there was like 6,000. It was a big gathering, but it was for the purpose of declaring war or military strategy or nominating or electing officials or magistrates, had to do with business had to do with budgets he had the final say on legislation and the right to call magistrates to account so it was accountable it's like a, a government by the people for the people the ecclesia was government governing body is that what you think of when you think of your church is that what we say the church you going to church you're going to make decisions on commerce and government and morality and military and ethics. That's what the word means. That's what it meant to Jesus. Might be the first time you've heard this idea. It went, When I heard it, I didn't, I didn't even believe it could possibly be true because I'd been through seminary and had never heard it. This is what the background of the word meant. We tend to imagine that words mean or that they meant what they mean to us now instead of us understanding how we understand now based on what something meant when it was given that word, that meaning. He says, I will build my governing authorities on the earth and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Well, maybe I'm over, maybe I'm exaggerating. 
Well, remember later, it, uh, well, in, in the actually the next chapter in Luke, in Luke tap, chapter 10, he sends out the 70 or the 72, the different uh, manuscripts or ancient manuscripts use different numbers there. <clears throat> He's sending them out two by two ahead of him. So that means he's going to be going to these different cities. So 35, 36 cities. They're going out two by two to kind of let them know that the Messiah is coming. Let them know that Jesus is coming to town. The one who heals the sick. The one who uh, gives the sight to the blind. The one who confounds and and uh, the kind of religious and surfaces the heart. Jesus is coming. And they go, and he, as he gets them ready, he says he gives them authority to heal the sick. And they, they end up casting out demons. And he s- sends them to go proclaim the year of the Lord, to proclaim the favor of the Lord and the, the good news of the kingdom. When he sends them out, as he chooses that amount, that number, I'm suggesting to you that that number he didn't just pull out. We see in Genesis 10 uh, that there were the names of, again, rabbis for hundreds of years, actually 1,500 years, would have understood that there were that the, all the nations of the world were kind of represented in the, this original list of 70 or 72 nations. Accordingly, Jesus... I believe has the whole world in mind when he sends out the 72, that he's coming to bring the kingdom of heaven, a new kingdom to bear on earth. Just as the first journey of sending the 12 in Luke uh, 9 and in Matthew 10, um, as that signifies Jesus sending the 12 to really renew or reinstate or transform the government of Israel when he's sending the 72 I think he's pointing to a new thing about the world he's here to impact the world and so when he sends those 72 he sends them with this message the harvest is plentiful but the workers are few Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. So he's describing that people are in need and are really hungry for the truth of the kingdom of God. That's when it says a harvest is plentiful. He's describing there are many people who would like to be changed to experience a kingdom of heaven versus the world as they know it. And there's something in them. There's this hunger in them. But he says, pray, therefore, that the Lord of the harvest send out or literally to throw out or to cast out. It's the same words, actually, if you cast out a demon, it's like to expel, to throw workers out into the harvest field. You may have heard me say, I think this is possibly the most radical prayer prayed on the earth up till that point. Because up till then, the religious leaders were uh, priests and Levites, and they were down according to the family line. So you were born one or not. But at this point, Jesus is changing the way everything happens. And he says, we want to have workers. Why do we want to have workers? Because remember, he's sending them, he's sending his followers to disciple nations. I didn't put the passage in there, but most of you are familiar with the idea that we see at, as the last thing he might have said, even in his resurrected body is, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now we have the authority of nations. All authority of heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. See, he's always been talking this way. He's not talking about being a, a good person. He's not talking about being a good religious person. No, he's talking about changing the way things are done, that the kingdom of heaven would come on earth and that would impact all the nations of the world, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them everything to obey everything I've commanded you to do. So he's sending out the 70 to 
which I believe represents the nations, because that's what Jesus is sending you and me for. Why is he saying raise, pray for workers? Because workers, he's referring to disciples, people who come up alongside others and help them grow spiritually and be transformed. Does that happen with a prayer of salvation? I'm suggesting no. I'm suggesting that's the doorway, but discipleship is the transformation of the life. That's how Jesus trained his disciples, and that's what he did with his disciples. He didn't have them pray a prayer of salvation. He discipled them. He taught them about the kingdom of God and showed them how to conform their lives to this to these values and practices and to do that for others also. That's what Jesus wants for you and me, that he, that you and I would be workers that come up alongside other people and help them grow and tra be transformed by the power of God. Decisions of marriage, decisions of court, decisions of where they live or what their job is, decisions of how to handle raising children, decisions of how to forgive, the, all the things that we talk about in the curriculum of confession, forgiveness, healing, all these things, we come up alongside people to do it. How long does it take to disciple somebody? Pretty long. Because we want to be there when they show alongside them, when they're caring for their parents as they get older, or when their child has done something, trouble in the law, whatever the thing is, we're coming alongside and continually saying, what's the kingdom of God doing right now? What's the father saying? Even like Kristen said, let, let's take a moment, put your head on his chest, receive. What's he want for you? What's he doing right now? That's what discipling looks like. That's what it means to be a worker. And we need millions and millions and millions. And I want you to understand that the vision that I have for what we're doing in this course is it for you to have clarity in your life? Yes. I want you to be clear in your design, how he's formed you, how he's gifted you, what your personality, all those pieces of module one. I want you to understand your placement and your roles and be able to release the blessing, the power of God in, in those spheres to be miraculous in your roles. I want you to understand your purpose and walk in a rule of life and have a strategic plan. I want you to be able to release the resources of heaven to set people free and confession for you. All these things. I want you to be able to do them. I want you to not read about it. I want you to be at a place where you're able to do any of it whenever God wants you to, because you've learned how. But not only that, I want you to train others to do it. How? Like, what, what do you mean? You're like, to do your court? I don't care how. You can do it just by walking with them. You can do it by walking with them and using the manual of the release of resources of heaven. You can do, do it by walking with them and pulling apart little bits of the curriculum here. Whatever it is, everything that you're learning to do in this course, this isn't just for you. I want it to impact your marriage. I want it to impact your household. I want it to inter impact the generations in your family line how you interact in the workplace, not just to be a good person, a good moral person. I do not care about that. I want you to be a worker. I want you to experience the transforming power of the kingdom of God and to such a degree that you are able to equip and help others. So that's why I'm doing this, but it's not just what I, I think this is what everybody should be doing. So I got two questions for us to consider. And the first one is, what is God's job in this process of sending out the workers in the harvest, into the harvest? And the second question is, what's our job in the mix of this? And so I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about that together <clears throat> and thinking about the implications. And then we'll move in to the practical, like, what does this all mean for us right now? <clears throat> 